Uh, this morning's session is mainly going to be on the TMS uh, machine, and then this afternoon is going to focus more on the brain site and, and the integration between the two of them. Um, if I'm speaking too fast or if something doesn't translate, uh, just let me know and I'll, I'll clarify as, as best I can. Um, the first thing to, we're going to cover with, with TMS uh, is mainly the safety, you know, the safety guidelines to look out for. Uh, I sent Jay a paper, which I'm assuming everyone's kind of got and, and has read. Um, I mean, that, that really is kind of the main, you know, the main overall thing. And then I'll go into detail on a couple of points of that that you know, require a bit more clarification. Um, so the, the main thing with, with TMS, um, so safety concerns to have in mind with regards to implants that people might have. Um, with heating them up, so obviously when you put an electric current through something, part of the, the offset of that is it, it, it transfers heat. Um, there's no evidence of substantial heating of brain tissue so the actual cortex itself, there's, there's no evidence of that heating up um, with standard RTMS protocols, so the type of stuff that you'd be doing in your own research. Um, but it, it may pose a problem for people with aneurysm, um, people with, with implants like aneurysm clips. Um, so when you're pre-screening people for especially RTMS, just make sure that there's no you know, that, things that in the brain that could be damaged due to heating. Um, so the forces and magnetization um, put into the brain by the TMS coil, um, it, it may displace ferromagnetic objects. Um, so again, things like aneurysm clips. Um, the movement of implants inside the brain can cause, obviously, quite substantial damage. Um, so again, it's necessary to verify with your patient whether there's an implant in there or patient, whether there's an implant in there already. Um, as well, on, on every implant it will say whether it will be, um, whether it's compatible with a magnetic field or not. So if you just ask, ask your patient what their implant is, and obviously you'll be able to tell on that, you'll be able to cross check with anything online if there's any problem with that being um, ferromagnetic. Um, induced voltages, um, so the, the voltage generated by this um, can damage things. Um, I've broken a watch before now. Um, so just for the, for, especially for your operator um, and with your patient, it is worth removing anything kind of, you don't have to worry about your belt or anything like that. But so, because your hands will be close, so people giving TMS, because your hands will be quite close to the coil, it is worth just removing your watch and removing any kind of bracelets and stuff. Um, there's evidence that TMS is harmful to um, Im implants that are in close proximity to the device. Um, so usually vagus nerve stimulators, uh, cardiac pacemakers, spinal cord stimulators, um, they are considered safe because they're far enough away from the coil not to be in, have any current induced in them. Um, cochlear implants are not considered safe. So hearing aids, for example, because of they're in such close proximity to the coil, we wouldn't administer TMS on someone who has a cochlear implant. Um, if they're considered safe in the MRI, it's fairly safe. It's fairly safe to consider that they'd be good for, because obviously MRI induces massive magnetic fields, and you don't get that in a TMS coil. So. If they're considered safe in MRI, it's safe to say that they'd be considered safe on there. Um, with regard to deep brain stimulation and implants, there is some conflicting evidence that TMS uh, shouldn't be administered to anyone with a deep brain stimulating device due to the risk of developing a high current within the leads of the anodes. One paper from 2009 highlights this risk, um, but a more recent paper using newer deep brain stimulating devices um, found the opposite, so it's kind of conflicting evidence. So again, it's best to, on a case, case to, to treat those on a case by case basis. Um, so to date, the number of TMS studies that have been carried out on deep brain stimulation um, subjects has found no adverse side effects. Uh, there's no concern about the 
exposure to magnetic field um, for any subject uh, or patients or operators. Um, things to bear in mind during patient selection. Um, there's certain drugs can lower a seizure threshold. So RTMS can induce seizures. There's certain drugs that people can take that can lower those uh, seizures. So it's just worth making sure that those drugs haven't been ingested before um, stimulation can occur. Um, specifically, antidepressants, um, antipsychotics, and sedatives. Um, so it's worth, again, you know, it's worth double checking. Um, in children, TMS is not recommended below the, the age of 18 months uh, as the fontanelle, which is this kind of soft bit in babies on the top of the skull, hasn't closed yet. So the, well, we, know fairly, we know quite a lot about the distribution of current in the scalp. Obviously, that's passing through the scalp in an infant with that open kind of space. Obviously, it's more, much more direct. Um, Infants are also naturally much more cortically excited um, as cortical inhibitory systems like the, the GABA system, for example, is still fairly immature. So the use of an excitatory stimulation technique, TMS, for example, um, is, is not really recommended. Uh, finally, there's also an increased risk uh, of acoustic injury um, given the ear canal in, in infant populations is much thinner so specialised hearing protection on, on infant populations especially uh, is, is required. Um, in pregnant populations, TMS is considered safe, um, providing lumbar stimulation is avoided, so you don't want to be stimulating anywhere around the lower back. Again, that comes back to that proximity thing about the TMS coil being very close to the infant. Um, pregnant TMS operators should stay at least one, uh, 0 0.7 meters away from a discharging coil. So again, if you're stimulating your patient there, you know, that's uh, an arm's length is certainly far enough away from, from your fetus. Uh, side effects of the TMS coil there, they're more common in stimulation frequencies greater than one hertz. Um, so the risk of seeing side, any side effect, be it greater than one hertz. Um, so the risk of seeing side, any side effect, be it localised head pain down to seizures, which is very rare, uh, is about 18%. The most severe acute adverse side effects of RTMS is, like I've mentioned, seizures, um, which increases, the risk of this increases with higher stimulation frequencies, particularly in RTMS. Um, and smaller, in, smaller intervals between trains of pulses I'll go into more detail on that, obviously, when we run through the software. Uh, the, whilst I talk about this, the risk of this is still very, inducing a seizure, is still very, very low. Um, so between 1998 and 2008, in 10 years, there's four reported cases of inducing a seizure um, within safety guidelines. Um, that's in, in non-epileptic patients. Uh, so factors that may increase the likelihood of inducing a seizure during RTMS uh, include a history of frequent seizures, uh, medications that decrease seizure threshold, and diseases that potentially affect the cortical excitability, uh, like a stroke, for example. Um, it's recommended that people do multiple EMG channel monitoring, um, video recording, and involve a physician with an expertise in the recognition and treatment of seizures um, if you undertake RTMS in vulnerable populations. Uh, syncope, so fainting, and related symptoms um, have been seen to be caused by RTMS. However, this isn't seen to be a direct result of the TMS. There's often a, another thing in the, you know, in, involved in, in bringing on fainting. Um, so it's usually populations who are developed to uh, prone to develop syncope and are stressed due to the RTMS because it is, if it's a new thing to you, you can find it, you know, quite stressful. Um, they could have been hungry. They could have been quite sleep deprived. For example, yesterday um, I was quite jet lagged and was showing people uh, how to get a, a muscle twitch, and in doing so, I gave myself a bit of a headache. And now that's. It, it wasn't directly because of this, it was because I was quite tired as well. Um, 
So yeah, hungry, sleep deprivation um, can lead to people passing out while stimulation is being administered. Um, should a subject pass out, pass out uh, brain hypoperfusion can lead to convulsions in the patient, which look quite similar to seizures. Um, so treatment should be similar to that of normal loss of consciousness. So feet elevated, um, make sure the airways are clear. Um, local pain and headaches, like I mentioned that I had yesterday, is reasonably common. Um, bear with me, sorry. Um, so in eight to 10% of cases of RTMS, you'll find um, people get localized pain. The, the cause behind this is, 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 is unclear. Um, the symptoms are normally quite mild. So there's nothing really to worry about. Um, afterwards, plenty of water, and then should they want to take any painkillers, you can do. But again, make sure that the painkillers they are taking aren't going to lower that seizure threshold, because you could induce something later on much worse. Um, so I, and and that, that type of pain normally wouldn't lead to the interruption. A headache, you normally wouldn't interrupt a, an RTMS session because of that. Um, the, the hearing on this, um, so is this, have we got this turned on? Yeah. So if I just, I'll turn this up. Oh, bear with me. So the noise of a discharge coil, whilst it doesn't sound very loud, when that's on the cortex, obviously, um, that can exceed 120 decibels. And that's for a very, very short period of time. So we're looking one to three milliseconds. Um, but that is, the 120 decibels is still a level that is considered unsafe. Um, in, in, a very, in very few cases, transient hearing loss, um, so and, and so short, short period of hearing loss and tinnitus has been reported. Um, there's been one case of permanent hearing loss, which was with a H coil, which is a, I mean, people don't really use H coils now, but they're absolutely enormous. They cover the most of the, um, they cover most of the scalp, which is a very large area of stimulation. So TMS has been deemed safe in terms of the auditory uh, aspect, but the use of earplugs during high intensity stimulation should be considered and it should be, you know, we, we recommend it. Uh, participation in children is discouraged um, unless it's clinically important, but given that this is more of a research background, we probably wouldn't be seeing many infant populations anyway, uh, due to the different hearing canal resonance, so that thing I touched on earlier about that ear canal being slightly thinner. A uh, couple of guidelines overall then. Um, before the application of, T, uh, of, of TMS, be it single pulse or RTMS, the subject's decision um, to partake must be voluntary um, based on the provision of all the relevant information, so the stuff that I've already touched on and the stuff that is going to be uh, specific to your own protocols. The uh, potential benefit of TMS uh, must outweigh the risk so particularly in subjects who are more at risk of developing side effects, so the, the, your infant populations, your possible pregnant populations. Uh, there's, there's three TMS studies have been given three different classes of study. Um, there's class one, which has a direct benefit, but a potential high risk. Um, so it's diagnostic or therapeutic primary objective uh, with potential direct individual clinical benefit. The class two is indirect benefit and moderate risk, which is clinical benefit of this is more speculative and normal subject may participate as control subjects. And then there's class three, which is probably the, the main stuff that you'd be doing in a research setting, um, which has an indirect benefit and low risk. Um, there's no immediate relevance to clinical problems, but it's often useful to investigate scientific questions. So in terms of the safety, um, that is mainly everything that you need to be kind of aware of. Like I said, the paper goes into a lot more detail, um, but those are the, the kind of pre-screening questionnaires. Um, they should cover everything you need to know with regard to 
implants, um, whether they've ingested any kind of um, drugs that are going to lower that seizure threshold, um, and whether they're kind of feeling hungry or feeling tired or, or dehydrated, because all of those aspects can, they can bring on, uh, or they, they raise the chance of, of someone passing out during, during a TMS protocol. So yeah, that's your, your kind of safety guidelines. Any questions, or does that kind of cover everything that you'd, if it goes into quite a lot of depth. Um, I mean, we do a lot of kind of single pulse, um, so it's, it's more to do with that. Than, but yeah, cool, okay. So I'll run you through quickly the, uh, the TMS device itself. I'll just pop this over here for now. So normally when you administer RTMS, uh, RTMS, you're going to be giving RTMS a percentage of, of, a, of a threshold. Now to, to find your threshold, uh, to find a motor threshold, um, what we do is we administer a single pulse over the motor cortex. Now that will bring on a finger twitch or depending on obviously where you stimulate within the motor cortex. You can bring on a finger twitch or you can make the arm twitch or you can kind of bring it down to the leg. Or, so all the way through the body you can stimulate. And to do that, um, what we need to do is administer a single pulse. And then we want to see that first single pulse between 700 and 1,500 microvolt, uh, millivolts. Sorry. When we're getting 7 out of 10 uh, between those two numbers, we start to take the stimulator down. So we often won't be at 100%. 100, like 100% 100 is a very, very high threshold. Um, so normally, someone's motor threshold is going to be between kind of 60 65%. It varies from subject to subject. Um, Asian populations is always a little bit higher because you have a slightly thicker skull than kind of European and Caucasian populations. So you may see that you're up at 70%. But again, when it, it's, you know, we're talking 5 10% difference. We, I doubt we'd be up at 100%. Um, once that threshold has been found, so in the trace there, and I'll, I'll run through this, um, so you'll be able to see exactly the process of, of doing it. But once that motor threshold has been found, you want to turn the stimulator down, keep stimulating, turn the stimulator down, and you want to get five out of 10, so administer 10 pulses at a lower threshold, so something like, you know, let's say 48%, um, and if five out of ten of those pulses is 50 millivolts, which is, I mean, it's, you won't be able to see it in the finger twitch, but you'd, you see, you'd see a, a very, very small fluctuation in the trace. So when, you, when that is, is small enough and you're getting five out of ten of those, so 50% of your, of your pulses are 50 millivolts, um, that's your resting motor threshold there. So normally, you'd, you'd stimulate a percentage of someone's resting motor threshold. So the, I mean, the, way, the way the stimulator works, um, basically, in, inside this box um, is, a, is a big capacitor. Um, the capacitor is, is pulling charge off the mains. So it's plugged into the mains in the wall. Every time we press the button on the coil, it is discharging all of its current down the coil down the, down the wire, there's two windings inside this. So this, this whole unit is called a coil. Inside each half of the coil are copper windings. So the current travels around the copper windings and back down. The current going in both ways creates an electronic field. And obviously, so if magnetic field's going that way, electronic field goes down. So that induces the current inside the head, which then because it's going both ways, comes back to the magnetic field, therefore TMS. Let me just grab my notebook. Okay. Um, anything below one hertz um, is excitatory. Anything above there, kind of 10 hertz, is inhibitory. So your, your RTMS protocols that you'd most likely be doing is inhibitory. Um, the excitatory stuff with the, the polarization of neurons, um, 
is excitatory. Hence, when we administer one single pulse and we see a twitch, that's because we've excited the neurons in a specific location and enabled them to fire. Okay, so what we do then? So if we have, I'll hook this up. Any questions so far? Cool. All right. I don't know if that's a good thing or not. <laughs> <laughs> so what we've got here, uh, inside one of these packets, so you've got, you've got more of these packets here, but this is your EMG starter kit. So in this, you've got um, single-use pre-gelled electrodes, um, which you'll be able to buy from, from anywhere. You can buy them from Rogue Resolutions, or obviously you can pick them up um, anywhere online. Uh, you've got your grounding strap there, and then you've got, so that is the rest of your patient ground, and then you've got your electrodes here. Um, normally electrodes you'd see come in kind of red or black like this, and you'd run two wires into your EMG and plug them in red to red, black to black. Um, we like to use this kind of single lead because just it's much more, it's much neater than having Obviously, you can see down here, there's quite a few wires kicking around, so it's much nicer just to have a single lead. So you can plug that in there, and then if we watch, I don't know how well you can see it, but if we watch this screen, when I plug it in, there'll be a whole load of noise. And then, so we've got that there, that massive big disruption of noise there. That's because I've plugged it in, and because my hands, which I've given off an electrical signal, are quite close, to the, uh, quite close to the electrodes. If I was just to lie that down, that should settle down now. He says. There we are. So because they're moving around a little bit, there is still a little bit of activity there. But you can see that they've settled down quite a long way. Um, you've got a notch filter on here where it says notch on. What that is doing is filtering out any noise, any electrical noise at 50 hertz. Um, so that's just, I mean, everywhere has electrical noise. Um, so that notch just takes out the 50 hertz, which is just your mains electrical noise. So to get, um, to get a single, to get a, a resting motor threshold, what you want to do is, is ground your patient. So using something like this, so you've got a nice silver backed very conductive strap. Um, you want this to go around somewhere uh, which has a bony protrusion. So the best place, if you're doing um, motor threshold in the hand, the best place is the wrist, because everyone's got this kind of, this bone here in the wrist. So you're gonna wrap this around here, nice and tight. And then pop your grounding strap on as well. So it's just a nice stud that clicks in there. Just means that your patient doesn't have to be hooked up all the time. And then once we're done there, into PG in the, EM, in the EMG module there, PG stands for patient ground. So that can go in there. And then what we want to do is get our electrodes. Now I used these yesterday. We don't recommend using single use electrodes twice because they get skin out, if I actually get kind of dead skin and dirt on them. Um, but for the case of a demonstration, we might be able to get away with it. So what we want to do is if I'm going to do the FDI, which is this kind of juicy muscle in the thumb there. So to find that you want to stick one electrode right on the belly of the muscle, so in the main, the main kind of bulk of the muscle. And to do that in the FDI, if I push my index finger towards, you can see you're getting that muscle is tensing up there. So one electrode 
but make sure when you stick them on that the black bit, so the black bit is a bit that's going to register the electronic signal, so you want that black bit to be sat over the main bit of the muscle there. And then further down the finger, you want the other electrode over the origin of the muscle. So again, we're coming out of the knuckle there. We'll make sure it's well stuck. When you're popping your electrodes on, um, you don't really need to worry which order they go in. But it's, it's common practice within, the, um, within EMG to have the black electrode on the belly of the muscle. So if you think black to belly, it's fairly easy to remember. So we have the black on there, and then the red on there, and we should see. So now I'm hooked up to this, and we should be seeing my activity on this screen here. So at the moment, when I stand like this, nice and relaxed, see we're not getting a trace there. And then when I start to wiggle my finger, that's making that trace go up and down. So what we're going to do is administer a single pulse of TMS over the motor cortex. That's going to get my finger to twitch. And then we can start to bring that down. And we'll see, we'll see a peak to peak volume in here. So this one here in this window is going to be our pulse that was just administered and the EMG um, trace from that. In there is going to be the last five that we see. And, and our, average D, our average numbers are going to appear in here. Once we've done that, we can save that as our resting motor threshold. And then we can, do, we can administer a stimulation as a percentage of that resting motor threshold there. You all keeping up so far? Cool. OK. So we'll just take this off here. So this is the uh, tricky bit. So when you administer TMS to the cortex, because of the way the brain's wired up, obviously, you stimulate on the opposite side to the EMG, because everything travels across. So what you want to do is turn this up slightly. So I've got quite a high threshold. So if we start at 70, this is always hard with one hand. We start at 70, over the motor cortex. If I sit, you see there was a slight finger twitch there. So every time you administer a pulse, you might find sometimes it's quite difficult to find, find the area. Um, we can use the neural navigation software to help us with that, which I'll, I'll go into that this afternoon. Um, but when, every time you're administering a pulse, you are obviously changing the activity within the brain. So sometimes when you're depolarizing, you can, because if you administer pulses um, more than one every second, you start to change the activity within the cortex. So it can be kind of very hard work to, if, you, if you're not familiar with the motor cortex, it can be hard work to try and find something. And then every time you administer a pulse, you're actually making it more hard work for yourself as well. So we recommend leaving about one to one and a half seconds in between pulses when you're trying to find the, motor, when you're trying to find the right part of the motor cortex. See. So we've got the hand there. So we should be seeing there on the screen 
we should be seeing traces with the peak to peak volume on. So what you want to do is administer 10 pulses and if we're getting 10 out of 10 at between 700 and 1500 millivolts then we're going to wind that coil down and we're going to take it all the way down until we get um, 5 out of 10 at 50 or below and then that's our resting. Um, so have we got anyone that knows the motor cortex and would like to use me as a subject? No? Okay, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> so, so because I won't be able to feel the, because the, the trace is so small, I won't be able to actually feel the finger twitch. I won't be able to do a resting motor threshold on myself um, because you need, you need an operator and a subject to be able to do it. Um, so I can do the active, that's no problem there. So what we're seeing in there, so you can see there, we had a really big record in there. So 7,961. So that is much higher than we need to, to get, an act, to get, um, to get you to find the motor threshold. Because like I said, normally we just need to be seven, between 700 and 1,500. Um, so that was at 81%. So you can see there, we've got our peak to peak volume there. And I'll just unplug myself so we're not getting a load of noise. So I've got our peak to peak volume there. And on this screen, you can double tap any screen there. And you can zoom in and you can see the specifics of each one. And if you double tap, it takes you back out of it. Again, on your, EM, on your live EMG trace, you can double tap. So we're, we're seeing two different ones there. We're, we're seeing two views of the same trace. This trace here is zoomed in um, to 1,000 millivolts per division. and then. This trace is the same, it's the same um, division, but it's just sped up. So we're seeing, we're seeing there, this to this is 100 milliseconds, 100 microseconds, sorry, whereas this here is 20 seconds long. So anything I do here will be seen in this 20 seconds later. And again, that can all be changed. So you've got two arrows here. So you see that was gone down to a second, 500 milliseconds, and we can take that back up as well, two seconds. And then, again, we can make that shorter and longer. So it's really nice kind of functionality and usability to it. And we can zoom in and out of the trace there as well. So we can make those, and these, these work individually of themselves. So you can zoom out to get as much or as little information as you need to from your, um, from your EMG trace there. So if we double tap there and go back into, so that there, like I said earlier, that's your previous traces there. And you can zoom up and down using this. The screen's a resistive touch, so you need to kind of press, it's like force touch on a, on a smartphone. So you need to kind of press there and you can drag it. And we can see that we've got this here. So we've got 20 microseconds and then the EMG of the, of the wrist twitch that we were getting there. So we bring that down and you can, is that for me? So we'll double tap there. So we've got all our, all our results there. And what we can do then is set that to 7961. So uh, if we were to set that, so say for example, we did the next step and we found the five out of 10 at the, the, the resting motor threshold. What we can do there is if we can click set RMT and that sets me as a patient as 81%, which is, I mean, 81% is far too high for a resting motor threshold. We'd, we'd never be up there because I'm not able to do the rest of the threshold on myself. Um, we'll, we'll set that just as an example there. And then we can go back to patient list. Oh, sorry. You need to, before you go back there, you need to disable so you can't accidentally administer a TMS pulse. 
So we disable there, and we can go back to the patient list there. I probably should have done this before I actually administer a TMS pulse. What you can do in, on this one here is you can, if I can swing this forward a little bit so we can, we can add a patient. This is our kind of home screen, if you will. So we can always add a patient here, uh, delete a patient, look at a previous patient's tests. Um, it's all saved on this. You can export it as well should you want to. Um, so to add a patient, it's quite straightforward. You just click Add Patient, type in there your surname, first name. Um, you can either give someone um, an identification number, or if you don't give them one, the system will just give them one itself. Um, if you look into kind of, uh, if you look into blind the trials, um, it is worth typing it in because when the machine gives them, um, it just gives them a numerical order, so it's going to be quite clear who is number three and who is number four. So pop all the details in there and then click OK. And we've got our new, our new subject there. And you can see there for the new subject, we've got no records. So that's because we've not administered anything there. It's always worth bearing in mind on this one um, that we make sure you, you don't delete any. Um, you, you always leave one that hasn't been deleted. Um, we found last time, uh, oh, well, we found, we found fairly fairly recently that if you delete all of them, the software just kind of goes haywire and says there isn't one there. So you can't create a patient from, from zero. Um, you always need to add one. So yesterday we put on one there that says do not delete. If that just stays there, then there can't be any problems. So we'll select this one. You can see you've got your, your record options there. That's to export anything. So say, for example, we've done an MEP there, so motor evoke potential test there. We can export all that data um, into whatever analysis software you like. So um, we've got MATLAB, Brain Vision, or ASC2. Um, and you've got your shortcuts to those down there as well. You can also delete stuff if you've done a test that was found to be kind of inconclusive. You can, you can just delete that. And historically, you can also go back into any of those tests. Um, if I click off there, you can go back into any of those tests. Oh, come on. By double tapping. So it's been finished. All right. Bit of fun settings there. My apologies. It's not going to let me do that. Ignore that bit. My apologies. So we can see there. So if we go in and create a new test, so we select the patient there. So that's, that's our kind of first screen. We're getting an EMG trace, which is live. And then we've got, the, we've got the two modes up here. So we've got MEP or MT mode. So MEP being motor evoke potential or motor threshold. And then we can go and choose our test. So this here is to administer um, a predefined RTMS protocol. So you can either develop the protocols within your own software and then use that software as a trigger in. Um, so on, the, on here, we've got um, a trigger import. So you can have your, 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 your kind of laptop or whatever and then a signal generator signal generator into the stimulator. So use that to drive the stimulation. Or you can develop the, uh, the protocol on this itself. If we go to protocol setups, you can see here. So we've got a test here. And we've got on this page, again, really nice and intuitive. We've got number of pulses, uh, the frequency of those pulses, and the stimulation at the percentage of the, the threshold that we've just found. So for example, in me, the one we've just found was 82%. So we can stimulate at 80% of my threshold being 82% of the machine. Um, the number of bursts, so we can have, um, this is a theta burst um, protocol here. If we go into a repetitive one there, um, actually we started on bursts, so we might as well carry on with it. So you've got your number of bursts in each train. Um, so we've got, in this one, so we've got six pulses at 50 hertz. 
and then we've got 10 bursts, and then the frequency in between those bursts as well. So you can see we're doing six and then a gap, and six and then a gap, and six and then a gap. And then in between each train, we then have that into train interval as well, which can be defined. Um, and you, you, you've also then, you can set the number of trains that you do all together. So we could do um, five bursts in each train with the gap between the bursts can be set, the gap between the train can be set, and then the gap between each pulse within each burst can be set. So everything, you, you know, you can, you can play around to the nth degree. You can really specify exactly what, what you want to do with your research there. And to change any of those, we can just click on there, and we can choose our number there. Or we can use the arrow there, and we can go up or down. Uh, so again, we can do that on there as well. We can go up or down. Um, in, ooh, I'll just close that. in repetitive, obviously, it's much more simple. Um, because you don't have those bursts to define, so you don't need to, to go into as much detail. So you've just got your number of pulses, um, the frequency of those pulses, and again, the stimulation at, at the percentage of the motor threshold, and then number of trains and your inter-train interval again. Um, so again, we can turn those trains up. So if we, so for example, we, we run five trains with an interval of five seconds between those trains. Um, if we save that protocol, and if I run that protocol on the coil, you'll be able to see what it sounds like. So when I enable this, and if we, if we listen to the coil, so enable there, yes. So we're getting, we're getting a safety limit there because the, that one that I've just kind of defined as a as a demonstration uh, is regarded to be outside the Wasserman safety limits. Uh, again, those Wasserman safety limits can be kind of found online, um, but they're now, those Wasserman safety limits are a bit old now, so this will, you can, you can decide to turn this off, um, which, and again, this comes from a clinical background, so research background, you will find more and more will be outside of those defined safety limits, um, but in a research environment, obviously, it is going to be because it's a research environment. Um, so if I was to start the stimulation there, you can see we've got a little thing on there just to say that we're, we're kind of outside that safety limit. We can either start the stimulation here or we can start it on the coil. So that was the protocol that we defined just there. Um, obviously really nice and short, um, but a full RTMS protocol is to be uh, a little bit longer. Um, for example, in my notebook there, um, we've got a depression protocol, would be uh, 10 hertz stimulation uh, for five seconds, repeated 30 times with a wait of 26 seconds in between each protocol, um, in, between each, uh, in between each train. Uh, so that is your, your kind of standard um, RTMS protocol that helps that's been found to, to, to help depression. Um, so that covers pretty much everything kind of with the RTMS machine, uh, with the EMG, how to use the coil. Um, you've got on here as well, so you've got head box battery just up here, um, which is the battery in here. Uh, they use lithium ion batteries, um, they're not double A or anything, unfortunately. Um, so what we do is we also supply you with, which table have I left it on? So you've got a battery charger there. Um, obviously, when your batteries get a little bit kind of worn, we can, we can just recharge. Just pop that down. Uh, we also have the temperature of the coil is shown there. Obviously, something that is, is known when you do RTMS is the coil does get quite hot. Um, when that coil does warm up, um, the, the machine just won't let you administer any TMS. Um, so what you've also purchased is the cool coil. So you can see there, in terms of the same, so this is also a 70 BF, 
So 70, the radius of, of each winding is 70 mil. But on this one here, you can see we've got fans on the top. So as soon as this coil starts to warm up, these fans will kick in, meaning you can, you can still administer RTMS for a bit longer than you can do with a normal coil. Um, with these normal coils, to cool them down, you can stick them in ice packs, which will help to kind of dissipate some of that heat. Um, so should this one be in use, you would be able to use this with an ice pack for, and try and extend that usage a little bit longer. You also have another coil. So what you can do is you can just switch coils in between each. And you can deliver, say, for example, we deliver five trains. We can switch coils and then pop this kind of new coil back in. Um, you can see that each coil has got kind of um, this thing stuck out the end. That is for a, a subject tracker for brain sight, which we'll cover this afternoon. It's also got these balls on here, which means you can hold it with the cart. Um, you see at the moment this cart has a red light on. That's because it's locked in place. So, for example, we've got our subject sat down, and it means it takes away any error, any human error that might occur with kind of very small movements in the coil. So we can just lock this in place. To unlock it, we use, not that one, we use this pedal here. And you can see that light's gone off, and it's... You can move it around. We can reset it. There's also the brain sight chair, which I'll cover. I'll cover after this. Um, again, which is which is great for keeping your subject nice and still. There's a chin rest. There's a forehead rest. Everything's very supported. Um, and there's also the coil the coil handles there, which I'll need to cover as well. So yeah, we can reset that and move that around. One thing to make sure is um, when you are changing coils is to start, turn the stimulator off. Um, I mean, the, the, the connection between the coils has been um, made so that there can be no kind of arcing uh, or anything like that. So they, they are very, very safe. But it is just good practice to turn the stimulator off when you take a coil out. And then when you put a new coil back in, turn the stimulator back on. Um, the power for this uh, is independent. So you're not going to lose all of this when you, when you flick the switch on there. And I think that's just about everything.